Hello, everyone. This webinar is now live and being recorded. If you are new to our webinar series, welcome and thank you for joining us. Criterion Edge runs multiple informative webinars throughout the year. Today, we are presenting Ask the Expert, IVDR Early Experience and Feedback. As this webinar is being recorded, you will be it will be available for you to watch on our website afterwards. You will also receive an email with a link to the recording and slides. Now, let's go ahead and get started. Dr. Sarah Chavez is the Director of IVD and Scientific Writing Service with, Services with Criterion Edge. Sarah has a Bachelor's of Science in Biochemistry and a PhD in Molecular and Cell Biology with 25 years of laboratory bench experience and has taught at the university level for the past 15 years. She has extensive scientific writing experience in an academic environment, as well as for several large textbook publishers. Sarah's strong background in basic research and her extensive experience with regulatory writing allows her to assist companies with IVDR readiness as part of the Criterion Edge team. We are pleased to present Dr. Sarah Chavez as our presenter today. Yes, thank you, Cheryl. So Sarah, we have a number of questions here from our audience and we'll start with answering the very first question which is what are the main reasons for a failed IVDR submission? I would like to understand the typical mistakes to avoid. That is a good question. Um, I think we'd all like to avoid the easy mistakes and kind of learn from the experiences of some of the first folks who have got out the gate quickly and already have notified body feedback. And luckily, a lot of us have been getting a lot of this sort of early regulatory intelligence and feedback from the notified bodies directly. At a recent RAPS meeting, they actually had a roundtable discussion and they were giving people just tips of the trade. You know, you could kind of tell what some of their pet peeves were and what are some of the trends? Um, you know, what are these easy mistakes? First and foremost, they said, you know, that lack of clinical evidence, they expected that and so that wasn't surprising. But one of the things that they are kind of surprised by is the lack of really a well-developed state-of-the-art section um, and a misunderstanding or I guess a misconception of what is meant by a systematic literature review. So they definitely want to see additional details. They want to see that you can fully support your state-of-the-art. And they want to make sure you're being consistent across your documents, especially in terms of your intended purpose. This is going to be really hard for some of these devices that have been on the market for decades. They have been used for potentially some off-label purposes, or maybe even the intended purpose has evolved and changed over the years. So going back through and being very clear and very targeted in what is your intended purpose and what is considered state-of-the-art for that same purpose, that's really what they're on the lookout for and what they're noticing first off. Thank you, Sarah. Let's go ahead to question number two. Can you clarify the classifications under IVDR? Sure. So these are going to be a little bit different than what we see with the FDA classifications, um, just first off. The most broad way of classifying these are going to be in, into these risk stratification classes. So A, B, C, and D are the risk classes. That's put out in Article 47 of the IVDR. Um, and really, your classification is going to go back to that intended purpose. And that's really what I mean by being very targeted with your intended purpose. Um, so for instance, let's say you have a device that's intended to diagnose HIV infection. That could put you in a Class C um, or, or a Class D. If you were to add in something about, um, you know, screening, it's going to automatically put you into that class D. So really, it depends on, um, you know, the what your purpose is. Screening inherently has a higher risk for public health than if you're using the device for the purpose of individual diagnosis. So when you're thinking about your risk classifications, you know, be be very clear on 
how changing your intended purpose could also potentially have this ripple effect for your risk classifications. So that's that would be my primary advice, but you're looking at sort of classes A through D, A is the lowest risk and D is the highest risk. Excellent, thank you, Sarah. The next question is, do you have any advice regarding the requirements of IVDR for the performance evaluation plan, the PEP? Yes, so we actually have a, an article that was published in PubMed fairly recently um, that does a really good job of laying out this concept of the PEP and that planning. Um, so we can pop that in here. Um, the PEP, if you think of this as almost like a, a, a scaffold or like an outline of how you're going to set about getting the information you need to fulfill the requirements. You wanna to describe to the notified body the process that you're going to use to do the performance evaluation report. So the PEP is really, you, you have to identify the approach that you're gonna take and your methodology, and then clearly describe each step that you're going to take to generate your clinical evidence. So it's um, it's going to try to integrate, you know, the evaluation itself. You know, are you going? What methodology are you going to use? How are you going to define the state of the art and your benefit risk ratio? And then it will also go into things like your your steps that you're going to take for post market performance monitoring. So really, in order to write a well crafted PEP you have to start by defining your minimal clinical performance levels that a new test should reach. And so in order to do that, you need to know the intended benefits, whether that's improving disease outcomes or reducing harm, um, you know, risk stratification, something to that effect. So intended benefits. Then you wanna look at what's the current practice. So that's gonna go to the state of the art. Then you wanna go to the description of the test's role in that clinical pathway. So basically describing what would happen if no existing, if there was no test, what would be the outcome for the patient? Are you fulfilling an unmet need in this whole clinical pathway? And then finally, you're gonna try to start to link that clinical performance requirements to the intended benefits. So showing that I provide a benefit, my test provides that benefit, and is able to improve clinical performance. And these are the minimal acceptable clinical performance levels set out based on my acceptance criteria. So really you're, you're setting the stage in the performance evaluation plan, but it's the plan that you're about to undertake. That's what you're describing to the notified body. Excellent, that is so helpful, Sarah. Let's proceed to question four. What are the main structural parts of the scientific validity report, the SVR? So the SVR, it's tasked with defining the association between an analyte and a clinical condition or a physiological state. So in order to do that, you have to develop clinical evidence based on a systematic literature review. So in this case, it will be a review of the articles around the state of the art and also your competitive search because you need to establish that acceptance criteria and the range of performance based on your closest competitors. So first off, set, up, set about describing your systematic literature review. Then you wanna go into some details about that state of the art. What have you found? What are the medical conditions being um, described? What are the other diagnostic options that are available? You know, what are the alternatives? And then you also want to describe any recommendations from professional societies or any expert opinions regarding the, this type of testing or how to make a particular diagnosis. And then you're going to leave off with that competitive landscape. So that's where you'll have your data that has been extracted from articles that you identified in your competitor search. And you're using that section to determine the safety, uh, or in this case, it's, it's primarily the performance criteria and the acceptability measures. The safety really, that's something that comes about in the MDR world. They always have safety and performance, but under the same analogous sections in the SVR, we don't really use the term safety. We more or less describe risk in terms of the risk of an improper test result. 
because there's no direct impact to the patient in terms of their safety as there would be for a medical device. So really it's, you know, the systematic review at the background section where you describe the state of the art, the guidelines, and then the competitive landscape. Very good, thank you. Our next question is, what is the best way of documenting the state of the art? I like to think of the state of the art as like the first step you want to take as the writer, as you are setting out on crafting PER. And even if you're still in the research and development stage of your device's um, lifespan, you know, the state of the art is going to tell you where you will be positioned in inside this entire competitive landscape. So it's going to help you define the criteria that you're going to need for your risk benefit analysis. And in terms of the SVR that we just described, it's going to also describe the analyte that you're testing and the test methodology to show that that analyte and that method of detecting that analyte are justifiable and that they're a scientifically valid approach for making a particular diagnos diagnosis. But then you also want to describe the analytical performance. You know, how do you define your proper endpoints and your analytical performance measures that you're going to be capturing? So ultimately, the state of the art, you want to document where your IVD is positioned within that scientific landscape, justify the choice of endpoints and your performance criteria, and really set the stage and define and limit your clinical context and the PICO terms, where that's your patient population indication, comparators, and outcomes. Excellent. Thank you. Question six, how do I know what performance objectives are required for a cancer IVD? So, there are some really good guidances again, and I've pub I've put one up here. This was actually even highlighted by one of the notified bodies at the recent um, RAPS meeting. This article that's been put out by MedTech Europe has a wonderful table that describes typical analytical performance measures and clinical performance measures. I would say the best approach to take to know what performance objectives you're going to want to capture is going to be that competitive landscape, you know, that you're going to do early as part of that state of the art section. Look at how the other tests that you would consider to be your direct competitor, look at how they judge their performance. There are some typical like usual performance objectives that we see across the board, regardless of whether it's a cancer IVD or a general biomarker or whatever. Those are going to all be dictated by your intended purpose. So you're going to look for things like sensitivity and specificity, uh, predictive value, area under the curve. Um, you can also, if you're looking at classification, if that's your intended purpose is to classify one type of drug, like a triple negative breast cancer or something like that, if classification is your is your goal, you may look at an agreement table. If you run your test, how often do the results from your test agree with other ways of making that diagnosis? Maybe it's a prognostic um, cancer IVD. You know, you can use this test to determine whether or not a patient has a poor prognosis. In that case, look for hazard ratios or odds ratios or even Kaplan-Meier survival curves. And then if you're looking for monitoring, maybe it's something like um, PSA testing for prostate cancer. In that case, you know, you may not find necessarily hazard ratios or odds ratios, but you'll definitely find sensitivity and specificity. Um, you know, therapy stratification is another one. If you're going to put a patient on a particular drug based on the results of your assay, you may look at what are the outcomes? You know, what's the response rate of patients who use your test to determine whether or not they're a candidate for that drug? Maybe it's that candidates who had your testing do far better than putting everyone on the drug. So that shows the clinical benefit of your test that you can determine and predict whether or not a patient is more likely to respond to therapy. So there are some tricks to it. You know, if you're starting completely new to this, I would say look at how your competitors typically um, 
collect the data, what types of um, performance objectives are they regularly reporting out, but then also take a look at these um, tables that are put out by MedTech Europe. They will be immensely helpful. Wonderful, thank you, Sarah. Our next question is, should we consider competitor device not using the same marker, nor technology for the similar device performance assessment, PER and PMPF? This can be tricky. Um, and you can, you absolutely can. Um, the trick is it goes back to that intended purpose again. So when you look at the IBDR Annex 1, um, there's a table in chapter three that describes the, you know, the device's intended purpose and as being the basis for clinical evidence. So the very first step is you have to define what is detected or measured. So if you've got now a separate competitor device that is not using the same marker, you know, what it's detecting or measuring is actually different. You will want to describe from a scientific validity perspective why that other biomarker is comparable to your biomarker. Do they have the same level of sensitivity and specificity, generally speaking? Are they, is one produced with the same timing as your particular biomarker? So if you are a novel device and you are the only test out there that detects a particular biomarker, you're pretty much gonna have to rely on other biomarkers as your competitors and show I, can detect with this degree of accuracy, my closest competitors who detect a different biomarker, here's how they perform. But you will wanna make that distinction and pay attention to the different types of analytes. Any differences or similarities between them, be sure to specifically call that out in your, um, in your scientific validity report. I would also caution trying to be really similar in terms of if the other biomarkers are qualitative and you too are qualitative assay, or if you're you know, comparing quantitative versus quantitative or qualitative versus qualitative, that's gonna be really helpful. And also keeping in mind the specimens required. It gets a lot harder if you're comparing tests that use blood versus urine or something to that effect, because clearly, the sensitivity is going to be different depending on the tissue that you've selected. So those would be my my points of caution for that. Um, but you can absolutely use these as a, a comparator. Wonderful, thank you. We are now 50% of the way through our webinar today. We do have seven more questions to go. So we'll move forward into the next question, question eight. What are the requirements for laboratory developed tests and in-house IVDs? These, I, oh, yeah, the, oh, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> These are going to be some, very, this is an area that I think a lot of people are very, very concerned about, um, primarily because the lab developed tests are not even defined or really even mentioned in IVDR, but they're covered by it. So it's a very tricky place to be in if you have one of these lab developed tests. Um, the, no, what we're hearing so far is that the same classification systems that are applying to I, typical IVDs also apply to lab developed tests or in-house IVDs. So the compliance is not necessarily just dependent upon where your test is being conducted. So, a good rule of thumb is that at a minimum, you have to comply with general safety and performance requirements that are set out in that Annex 1 of the IVDR. Um, you should also look in terms of your risk classification, follow the same classification rules under the IVDR in Article 47 and also in Annex 8. Um, if you are a health institution, you are covered under that ISO 15189 um, if you are a testing service, it's likely that you're going to need that ISO 13485 certification as well. So, you know, a lot of people are saying, I have the ISO 15189, is that sufficient? If your IVD is a class B, C, or D, 
you may want to go ahead and get the ISO 13485 or at least be prepared for that possibly being required. And it's primarily because the 15189 certification is focused on the requirements for using in-house tests, but the ISO 13485 adds those extra requirements in terms of manufacturing. So really the 15189 doesn't necessarily cover all of the requirements under the IVDR. So this is something to be sure to ask your notified body about early on. Very good, thank you. Question nine, is there any guidance on well-established technology in IVDR like there is in MDR? So uh, this is another one where they use, we use this term all the time, but well-established technology, it's used in the MDR and it's not actually defined in the MDR. The best place and the best guidance we have for this really is MDCG. They published the guidance 2020-6 and that's the, really the best guidance to get some sort of clarity as to what a well-established technology is. And they define it as being a simple, common, or stable design with little to no evolution, or a generic device group that's well-established in terms of its safety that hasn't been associated with safety issues in the past. Um, it has to have a proven clinical performance, or it has to be a very generic device group that represents the standard of care and really has had little to no evolution in terms of its indications or intended use or the state of the art. So that kind of implies that it's been on the market for many years. Um, you know, we don't necessarily have any additional guidance from the IVDR world, um, but I would say the same general principles are going to apply. If you're going under, if you're going to try to state that you are a well-established technology, that doesn't negate the requirement for clinical evidence. You still want to go through the same steps to establish what is state of the art and show the history of it, show the evolution and the maturity of the technology, that the state of the art is stable, that it's well accepted in terms of the uh, clinical guidelines. Um, is it as well established and standardized or is there still a, some you know, de debate over the standardization of these assays. Those are the things to be on the lookout for from the IVDR perspective. I would say you can be well established and you can be well accepted in terms of professional guidance, but pay attention to whether or not you are also standardized or if there are common specifications that should be mentioned um, in terms of the accepted performance levels. We get lucky with some of the devices where there is a set level that has been put out in the common specification saying a device shall achieve a sensitivity of at least 99% or something. But for the most part, most of the well-established devices don't have that magical number that's been published and available to us. So you have to be prepared to still support the clinical evidence of your device and show that it's well-established. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Our next question is, how would you suggest we can best synchronize IVDR and FDA submissions? This is a really good plan. Um, I would say there are going to be a lot of points of potential overlap here. So there, but there are some things that are going to diverge. Like first off that classification, you know, the IVD classifications for the IVDR and FDA are not the same. It's not a one-to-one -one correlation. So first off, see what classification you fall into and don't assume it's identical. Then in terms of your post-market surveillance plans, um, the US uh, IVD regulations require that you have this reporting for any type of malfunction that could lead to a serious adverse event. Um, in the EU, you know, most of the IVD companies that are transitioning don't really have a, um, a plan in place yet, but the IVDR requires a much more well-defined and astringent plan for PMS activities. So if anything, I would say your post-market surveillance is going to be a little bit more strict or a little bit more fleshed out on the IVD side, IVDR side compared to the FDA. Um, the clinical evidence really 
That requirement, it depends on the classification, but there's no reporting requirement laid out for the FDA. The FDA really just emphasizes the manufacturer's own verification and validation studies in order to support the performance. But under the IVDR, you have to show sufficient clinical evidence for your own device or and or an equivalent device if that can be justified. And that's the challenge. Where and how do you find that data and how do you define sufficient? So it, I, I would say my main suggestion would be to align on what data you have and align on how to make sure that you are using the correct terminology, whether or not you're preparing a report for IVDR or FDA submissions. Terminology is different. The requirements are different. It's not just a simple copy paste, although there are large pieces of these documents that are going to be usable across both of them. Thank you, very good. Question 11, if the study uses samples from US only, must manufacturers prove that the US population is similar to an EU population? This is a perfect example of that FDA to IVDR submission question. Um, we Let's say you have a clinical study that you ran for your FDA submission and now you're going in under the IVDR. You can use your data, but you do have to show that the overall prevalence in the population is similar. Um, so that can be something, if, if it's a general biomarker for something like heart disease, then you would absolutely want to show that, you know, the, pre the overall prevalence in the different populations that were studied is similar to the EU population. But if it's something like detecting um, infectious disease and you're determining, um, you know, antibiotic sensitivity for a particular virus or, or for a, partic a particular bacteria, um, or like a particular type of virus, a strain of virus, that could vary from one population to the next. So maybe you can detect the prevalent strain of a virus that's circulating in the U.S. population, but is that the same most prevalent virus in the EU population? That's all going to need to be documented within that scientific validity report for sure. Very good. Thank you. Next. What are the minimum requirements a clinical study should have in order for a product to be IVDR compliant? And is it possible to have IVD clinical study with leftover or archived samples in house? So first off, you can use archived samples in specific instances. They are, those are going to be considered and fall under the terminology of being a normal performance study under the IVDR, um, unless they fall under particular categories. Um, and this all appears within the IVDR in Article 58. So if you have leftover samples in which surgically invasive sample taking was done, um, or if it's an interventional clinical performance study, or where the conduct of the study involved additional invasive procedures or risks in terms of the sample collection for the subjects of the studies. Those types of studies may have additional requirements. Um, but ultimately, all performance studies are subject to the scientific review under the IVDR. Um, so you can use them, but you may need to still notify locally for ethical approval. Um, so I would say it's it's not a no, but you do have to make that justification as to why you are using leftover or archival samples. Um, really, the minimal requirements are again set out in that are in the IVDR under Article Fifty Seven. They state that a performance study should be designed and conducted in such a way to protect rights and safety and dignity and well-being of the subjects um, and to assure that the data is being generated in a scientifically valid, reliable, and robust approach. So it is quite broad, you know, but you do you are expected to use best practice in terms of setting up your clinical performance study and be able to justify the number of patients you're including, the study sites that you've selected, um, the protections to the patients themselves, 
you know, you need to be able to justify all of that in order to be considered IBDR compliant. Thank you so much. All right, we'll move to question 13. Is ISO 13485 necessary for IVDR? And do you have experience in when to start each process and or some do's and don'ts? Is it necessary? Not, not, not really, but it's highly suggested, I would say. Um, and the re reason for that is that they have harmonized um, ISO 13485 to MDR and now to IVDR. So ISO 13485, for those of you who are new and, and are not quite as familiar, speaks to quality management systems and the requirements that are needed for regulatory purposes. So in order to have an IVDR compliant QMS, um, it's, it's important to take on and to look at the requirements set forth under ISO 13485. But there are some specific aspects of the IVDR that are not covered in 13485. So there could still be some gaps. It's not going to be all inclusive because it's been sort of retrofitted to be harmonized to the IVDR. Um, but the reason why it might be preferable is that, you know, the MDR and the IVDR both recognize and state that using a harmonized standard is a means to de demonstrate conformity with general safety and performance requirements. So the technical documentation that they require that asks for a list of harmonized standards or common specifications to show compliance could really benefit if you can show compliance under ISO 13485. So no, it's not required, but it's meant to be a, um, you know, a tool to use to demonstrate conformity. So it's meant to be helpful. Um, there are, you know, those, those extra requirements in terms of your QMS under the IVDR. Those are going to be described in Article 10. Um, it's really made up of all of your documentation that supports your process. So it's your quality manual, your quality policy and procedures, and all of the work instructions and records. So in order to really create and document a proper QMS under the IVDR, um, they want you to describe how you're maintaining it, how you're keeping it up to date, and how you're seeking to continually improve your QMS. Excellent, thank you. Sarah, our last question today is, what are the specifics for software as a medical device? And could you make a dedicated webinar for that? Absolutely. We love getting suggestions from folks because a lot of these questions, I'm sure if you have a question, somebody else out there has the same question. And we are hearing a lot of sort of conflicting stories around software as a medical device. Um, this actually, again, it came up during a roundtable at RAPS where they have said, the notified bodies have said that there are, they're getting questions from folks saying, I don't think this applies to me when really, truly the IVDR does. So a lot of people just don't even know yet whether or not their software falls under the, the IVDR because a medical device software is really a software that's intended to be used alone or in combination for a purpose that is specified in the definition of a medical device under either the MDR or the IVDR. So in theory, you could have a software that could be either a medical device or an IVDR or fall under the IVDR. So when, or let's say you have a software that drives a device or influences the use of a device. In that case, it's going to fall under the same risk classification as the device itself. Um, if it's independent of any other device, it could be classified under its own right. And that's where that um, Annex 8 comes into play. But really the closest we have to guidance in terms of the software, um, there are some um, helpful tips in MDCG 2019-11 but this is clearly an evolving field. There are a lot of um, questions out there. So we will absolutely look into making this into a dedicated webinar. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sarah, for your presentation today.
If you enjoyed our webinar today, you may want to sign up to be notified of additional upcoming webinars produced by Criterion Edge. You can do so by clicking on the link, uh, webinar notifications on the slide. Uh, additionally, if you still have questions on the content we discussed today, or if you'd like to learn about our services, you can schedule a free appointment with our specialists. Our contact information is consult at criterionedge.com, located on the slide as well. You can also simply book a meeting at a convenient time for you with the link on this slide. Thank you everyone for attending and for all your questions. We hope this presentation gave you more insight into the in vitro diagnostic regulations as it relates to the submission of your documents to notified bodies for IVDR CE mark. Have a great rest of your day and we'll see you next time.